Hello everyone. Today we are going to be looking at the English opening variations beginning 1c4, knight f6, in contrast to uh, 1e5 that we looked at yesterday, and the move g3. Again, the English opening is very uh, complex and um, broad in scope, so we are trying to break it down one piece at a time. So today we are looking at continuations with 1c4, knight f6, and g3. All right, so now due to the fact that black has played knight f6, the games uh, are more closed in nature, and you get a lot of transpositions into king's indian type positions, nimzo indian, bononi, slav, uh, Queen's Gambit decline and such as trans possible transpositions into ready systems Catalan uh, for white so uh, It is a very rich opening Strategically and definitely favors the more experienced and knowledgeable player over the board So we're going to get right into it. Uh, we got quite a bit of games to look at and I hope you enjoy again at the end, please uh, hit my links uh, below for um, uh, to donate and also products related to this opening so again my method if you're not familiar with it is we look at only miniature games in rapid succession we don't go through theory all right that's not that's not the way to learn uh, what you should do is go through short games right usually with the uh, very strong player on one side and a weaker player on the other so you can see all of the tactics you want to see uh what it looks like when in this case when white just has everything go his way you want to see his plan with as little obstruction as possible so that you can get the ideas first before you start uh seeing games with more resistance all right so all our games are going to be under 30 moves and hopefully by the end of this video, uh, you can start playing some um, bullet games and blitz games with this particular variation. And then once you do that, then you go on and you start studying games that are a little bit more competitive in nature. This first game is from 2017 between Grandmaster uh, Artyom uh, Timofeyev, who was 2549 at the time. Uh, with the white pieces and with the black pieces, we had um, uh, Grandmaster Potapenko. I'm sorry, uh, he was just a master of uh, Potapenko. Um, and this was uh, doing a Russian Blitz uh, tournament. And again, I'm showing a Blitz game so that you can see the ideas of white uh, clearly here. So the game started out, as you can see here, C4, Knight F6, G3, G6. One of many transpositional possibilities, Bishop G2, D5. White took, C takes, Knight takes, and now D4, Bishop G7, E4. You'll see this setup uh, a lot as there are transpositional possibilities, as I said before, into uh, Catalan uh, type openings where black will play the move D takes C4 and then give up the center and uh, give white options to play all across the board sometimes white will play on the queen side sometime he would decide to go for the king side attack and sometime he will just push his pawns in the center of the board and create a pass pawn at some point knight b6 knight e2 castle castle knight c6 d5 knight e5 is also possible knight bc3 and now c6, black tries to destroy the center. Bishop f4, c takes d5, e takes d5. e5, d takes, bishop takes e6. So so far so good for black as the uh, white center is now uh, dismantled. However, if you notice his pieces are a little bit funky, uh, specifically the knights on the queen side. And notice the powerful uh, scope of the white bishops. Uh, pointing towards uh, Black's uh, queen side. This is again a major theme in uh, the English, uh, especially with the move 2 g3, is this uh, light square bishop 
often uh, putting great pressure on the queen side. Queen c1. Black's idea is very simple, and that is to eliminate black's powerful uh, bishop from g7. And notice the difference here is at least white has a knight here. Oops, sorry about that. Knight here on c3. And it's kind of blocking this pawn on b2, whereas this pawn is exposed. So if this knight moves somewhere else, say like here, for instance, uh, black has to make other arrangements for the protection of that pawn. Game continue. Rook c8, trying to exploit the position of the queen on c1. Bishop a6, queen e7. Bishop takes g7, king takes g7. Mission accomplished. Knight f4. Bishop c4, so we see black's plan of taking over the c4 square. Rook e1, queen c5, knight e4 now. Queen d4, and now we see this uh, sudden attack against the king side. Common theme, especially with the dark square bishop going. Queen comes in, king h8, and now black pays the price for this knight that was hanging over here. Bishop d5, rook a d1, and again we see black paying the price just for the lack of coordination of his pieces. Knight c3, and now this rook takes e5, knight takes a5, and this game ended with black being a piece down. Here's another one from uh, Timofeyev. Versus another master, uh, Oganian. Same opening. This time, black opts for a Nimzo Indian type setup with e6, d5, knight f3. So we have a, a more like a queen's gambit declined, if you will. And now c5, e takes, c takes, and now b4. All right. Bishop takes b4, queen a4 check, knight c6. And here, don't get it uh, mixed up, black. Black is, uh, you know, have some some slight advantage here, but uh, as you can see, white will have compensation here. He immediately puts tremendous strain on the queen side. This is one of the main themes uh, in the English, is uh, attacking on the queen side, again, using this powerful bishop here. You see in conjunction with the knight, putting pressure on c6, the queen has um, the knight pinned. So concessions have to be made. So he decides to play bishop e7 here. Uh, rook b8, probably better, but again, this is a, a speed game, so we're seeing errors. Knight takes c6, and after b takes c6, the rook still protects the bishop here. However, he played bishop e7, knight takes, takes, and then this queen takes c6. And the rook is snapped off. And of course, black had to resign in a few more moves. And I just showed you that short game so that you can see the idea of, of white attacking on the queen side. So now we'll go to our next game. Here is another example. Again, Timofeyev playing against a player named Gubski. Again, another setup whereby Black kind of plays almost like a Sicilian type setup. Look, it looks like a almost like a Marazzi bind a little bit, and we're gonna see here. White deciding to use his space advantage to conduct the kingside attack. So here, I mean, it could almost transpose into a Sicilian uh, here. Marathi bind to be exact. It's f4, g4, and we see the signaling of the uh, classic uh, kingside attack that would occur in the Sicilian. g5, knight e8. 
F5. You see the pawns just marching forward. And black here is in serious, serious trouble. Knight C7. G6, H6. He tries to keep the position closed, of course, but come on now. Bishop takes H6. Knight D5. Bishop takes G7. And uh, it's going to be mate in three. And black resigned. So there's another example. This time, black uh, being attacked on the queen side. On the king side, excuse me. Okay, now we're going to step back into the time machine. And we're going to go back to 1924. This is from Buenos Aires. This game is between Richard Reddy and Roberto Grau. So c4, knight of 6, g3, d5. Queen takes d5, knight of 3. Knight c3, queen a5. Bishop g2, bishop f5, castle. E6. So we have uh, from black a Karol Slav uh, setup formation. D3, C6. Sorry, Knight BD7. Bishop D2, Bishop E7. Knight D4 here. Bishop goes back. Knight D5 exploiting the position of the queen. Queen D8. Knight takes E7. Queen takes E7. Queen b3 attacking b7. Queen c5. Bishop e3 again uh, threatening some kind of discovery against the queen. And we can see black's plot problem here is, uh, you know, just moving the queen around too much. And coming under attack. Ready rightfully avoids the trade of queens. Queen is still in a bad position as you can see the bishop on e3. Queen c7, another queen move. Rook a c1. His queen is just having having a bad day here. He moves the queen again. Queen e5. And bishop takes c6. And the game is over. Black is uh, forced to resign here. The reason why is if b takes here, then simply knight takes c6 where mate is threatened as well as the queen at the same time. The reason why I showed you that game is I wanted to show you the latent power of this bishop just sitting there on G2. All right, usually that bishop will just be sitting there and not seem too involved. And uh, at the right time, it will strike against this queen side here. You know, very powerful uh, end to the game and demonstration of the power of of white's attack on the queen side let's look at another game from richard reddy this is from the t same tournament but round nine against benito vallegas now again we have this slav type uh setup And here, ready opts for the double fianchetto. Now, usually when you see this position, um, white is usually going to play in the center of the board. And usually this will um, culminate in some type of kingside uh, attack, usually. It's e4. D takes e4. And black is trying to steal a pawn on e4 by pinning the knight on c3. Queen c2, h6, a3, asking the question to the bishop, what are you going to do? b4, driving the bishop away. And now knight d4, rook f e8, rook a d1. So um, white is fully developed. Black is fully developed. White has a bit more space. All right, but black is solid enough in, the, in this Karoslav uh, formation. He just has to be careful being, um, you know, a little uh, little cramped. Ready plays queen c1. And now e5, knight f5, queen to e6. The knight drops back to e3. So, so far, so equal. Knight b6 putting more pressure on the c-pawn. C5.
and knight c4 it looks like a reasonable move and after all uh black was planning to attack the c4 pawn however better here was knight bd7 there's a tactical oversight here and after knight uh c4 Reddy is able to interpose with knight cd5 blocking the protection of this knight right here of course if the routine capture c takes d5 then just simply e takes d5 attacking uh this queen right here and again this is where this bishop comes to life okay the knight takes d5 then simply bishop takes d5 so again reinforcing what i said earlier that this bishop is always um involved even though it seems like it's it's dormant knight c takes d5 so now knight takes e3 because uh, again to go back it's the power of this bishop that makes a lot of these combinations possible so what happens here uh, again going back up to knight c4 knight c d5 uh black is basically becomes a piece down here knight takes e3 because of that uh, tactical oversight there and he drops his queen and he's uh, forced to resign again the purpose of showing that game is to show the latent power of the bishop on g2 which made the combination possible after the error from black uh, knight c4 okay it's this bishop right here that that is responsible for that so now we're going to look at our our next game now I want to look at a game between Max Erva and a player named Kirsten from uh, the Netherlands uh, Championship in Amsterdam, 1925. And again, we see um, kind of unorthodox play by white here, uh, excuse me, by black, but nevertheless acceptable. So Queen C2, we pick it up, Bishop E6 and here we go, the double fianchetto again by um, white here. Now bishop a3 is opposed to bishop uh, b2. Knight h5. And so we see here black playing aggressively. And of course he, he was threatening to play knight f4 here, so... This pin doesn't allow this capture, so this is why the knight had to drop back. And now what uh, black does, the white does here is he reinforces this knight because now he can't stop this from happening. So he would have to move the king, and so he just protects the knight. Meanwhile, he snatches pawns. And he's basically telling Black that his attack is is not enough, not adequate here. Black continues to attack. Knight takes d4. Queen takes d4. And now White has repelled the uh, Black attack. He castles. And now we see the attack, counterattack from White. Great move by Irva. Um... Erva was a brilliant tactician, uh, you know, in the uh, you know vein of uh, Alakon, uh when he was younger. You even see this if you study his games from the 1953 Zurich tournament. Uh, although uh, he didn't do so well in the tournament, if you look at the first uh, four to five rounds, he was playing brilliantly. I think, matter of fact, he was even tied for the lead. It was just that he was old by 1953, and he 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 got tired. And then he would become susceptible to tactical blows. But if you look at his first four or five rounds, he's playing playing awesome. Um, and I'm sure he learned a lot, too, from playing um, uh, Alexander Alakon in two matches. So, uh, but yeah, in his younger days, he was definitely like an awesome uh, tactician. Um, under, underrated chess player, in my opinion. Rook d7, king g8, rook takes c7, rook e6. And bishop e3. So there's an example right here of white attacking on the king side. 
and actually in response to blacks uh, attacks on this uh, same said side and whereas basically he refutes blacks attack on the king side and then turns the game around here's another game from Max Erva versus a player named Grofland 1925 and here's an example of a trap that um, many black players have fell into again it's a double fee and kettle setup and black plays this Slav uh, type setup if you will and notice the position of the bishop on f5 and the bishop on d6 and the knight on f6. So knight bd7, d3, castles, knight bd2, queen to e7, rook e1, and black play is playing by road here. Proper move here would be bishop g6 or bishop c5, moving one of those bishops out of the way. Steady plays rook fe8, all right, wanting to get in the move e5. But then he falls victim to d takes e4 d takes e4 d takes e4 hitting this bishop and then the next move is is just simply e4 so black had to resign this position here is between uh vasily smizlov with the white pieces and alexei sokolsky with the black pieces who is the um uh basically responsible for your 1b4 uh, orangutan or at least the uh, you know the modern variation of it so you can thank Sokolsky for the Polish opening orangutan or Sokolsky opening as you would call it in this position um, Smyslov had just played the move bishop c3 so Sokolsky figured that he can um, win a pawn here Playing C takes D f uh, after C takes D5, Knight B4. And the idea here is if A takes B4, then C takes B4, and you have this rook on C8 pinning, uh, pinning the bishop to this queen, and all is well. However, Smyslov found a great, a great uh, in between move, or Zhuizhenzhung, as they like to say, and Queen D2. And immediately, uh, Sokolsky was lost. He took the pawn, but he loses a piece. And again, the purpose of this game is to show you, again, the power of this bishop that's just sitting here on the diagonal. Because after knight b takes d5, b takes d5, knight takes d5, and now this bishop is hanging, which costs black a piece. Bishop takes d7, rook h7. Bishop c3, and the game ended in a few more moves. This game took place in 1955 between Albero Torran and Pedro Martin. The purpose of this game is to show you White's typical uh, plan in attacking the uh, queen side. So here, Black plays in typical uh, queen's camp gambit decline fashion and we transpose into an open Catalan variation all right open D takes c4 as opposed to c6 which which would be a closed Catalan Queen a4 check Knight bd7 and now the pawn is recovered now what is white getting here white is now has full access to the center where he can place another pawn in the center and once he does that and gains space then his opportunities uh, widen tremendously he can um, continue to follow up in the center with e5 driving black's pieces away uh, leading up to a king side attack if he will or he can continue to attack down the c file and in combination with this powerful bishop that we keep mentioning on g2 attack retard and cripple the uh, the queen side creating weaknesses over there and winning that's a typical way to play is concentrating efforts on the queen uh, queen side and that's what we're going to see in this game so c5 is played knight f3 and c5 is a typical response to try to um, uh, break down white center before he can really get it established with e4 etc knight b6 queen d3 c takes d4 and i do want to mention also that is part of the white's um 
fee, so to speak, that uh, for uh, for getting that big center is that his queen does come under scrutiny a little bit because after queen a4 check, the queen comes out, queen takes c4, and black usually tries to gain time against the queen for the uh, mobilization of his own forces. So that's what we see here, a little bit of give and take. Castles from white, bishop e7, knight takes d4, castles, knight c3, e5 from black, knight db5, and queens go off the board, e takes d3, rook d8. So, so far, so good for black, bishop e3, but notice the pressure on the queen side that white is uh, exerting. He gives up the pawn. Rook takes d3. So white is even the pawn down but has full compensation. Knight takes a7. Again, this is all due to the tremendous pressure on the queen side here by these bishops. Rook takes, bishop takes b6. So now material is equal. Rook a6. Bishop comes back. Rook goes home to d8. H3, keeping pieces off of G4. King F8. Rook F D1. Takes, takes. H6. A3. And the big thing to notice here, again, besides, of course, the bishops putting pressure on the queen side, is this 2 to 1 majority. Okay, as the pieces get uh, traded off, this position will edge more and more of white's favor. In white's favor. Knight takes e7. And now white has the bishop here. Plays bishop c5. Rook c7 check was, was good too. And this move is real simple. Just um, pinning the knight here. And this pawn is up for grabs. He plays rook a6 here. And then bishop takes b7, and black was forced to resign. Here's a game from 1957, play named Yager versus Belly. And the reason why I'm showing you this game is to show you that even uh, in the end game scenario, white's attack can be very powerful. So at the, the opening moves, the queens are traded off at move 7. And you might say, wow, how can this be a miniature game from this position? Um, well, we'll see. So bishop g5, bishop e7, castle was played, typical move. What I want you to really notice here is the end game. Look at the 4 to 3 uh, pawn majority on the king side that white has here. And look at uh, the 4 to 2 majority on the uh, queen side that black has. It reminds me of a reversed um, Berlin defense endgame, if you will. And the strategies are very similar. Uh, black is, uh, has a crippled uh, pawn majority, which is not too effective. So it's going to take him some time to try to unravel that. Whereas white has a, um, a, you know, a healthy pawn majority, where he's just going to... Uh, his strategy is going to be just to push those pawns up the board, create a pass pawn in a, a queen. All right. So right here, the game is equal for all intents and purposes. But Black's position is a little bit awkward. So although it's equal right from a theoretical standpoint, as far as playability, I would like to play White's position here. King e8, knight f3, bishop e6. Knight d4, so a6, e4, knight g4, bishops come off, king takes e7, rook d2, rook e8, a natural move to get the, uh, to try to get the, uh, pieces in the game for black f4 so we can see the majority moving rook a7 i really don't understand that move but that's why it's a miniature h3 knight f6 g4 and we can see the pawns marching up for uh white bishop c8 um 
Yeah, you only allowed so many bad moves. Uh, King F8 is just uh, better here. Or even B5 to get your majority going. Instead, he does Bishop C8. Too much passivity. So E5 happens. Knight F D. Oh, knight, knight F D7. Goodness gracious. Knight G8. Knight E4. G6. F5. G takes. G takes. F6. Black plays Knight D6. Uh, I just like E6 better here. Knight D6. Rook D8. E takes F6 check. King takes F6. Knight E4. Bishop F3. And Bishop sacrifices itself in a disgraceful manner. B5, and it's too late to be pushing those pawns on the queen side as uh, black is just down a piece. In this game, we see white conducting a kingside attack. So here we have this, if you want to call it a Benoni uh, type setup, although black, uh, excuse me, white does not play d5 here, he just exchanges. So it's more like a king's Indian, perhaps. Bishop e6, and the old school plan, just trading the powerful dark square bishop off. White solidifies his c4 pawn. Bishop h3. Knight d5. Knight c7. Knight e3. Knight comes e5. Knight d4. And white has an eye on that e6 square. And of course black just gives it to him, right? This wouldn't be a miniature without it. Knight e6. Bishop takes e6, bishop takes e6, knight f7. Of course, the queen is not really threatened on h6 at all. Rook d5. Queen to c3. And white says the heck with the rook and just plays rook to h5, threatening mate. Um, this is no big deal. This queen takes uh, a1 because after king g2, there's no more checks. And if g takes... Uh, uh, h5 here, that opens up the door for the knight here. Okay, and then uh, what do you want to do here? Let's say queen takes a1, king uh, g2, and there's really no other respectable uh, moves here. Okay, to stop the uh, to stop the beat down that's about to come. The knight takes e7 is coming. Check. King h8, and then the queen just drops by the same mate. Another example of typical play from white, typical play on the king side, queen side, that is. Again, early uh, exchange of queens. We see the cripple, crippled nature of the pawns on the queen side. And there, therefore, black will... Uh, excuse me, white will organize this attack in that direction. Again, threatening fork here. King e7, d4. d takes c5, earning the bishop pair. c takes b6. Rook a8. Rook f, c1. Rook takes b2. Notice again, the theme you'll see a lot is the 2 to 1 majority over here. Knight d4. Rook a takes a2. Knight takes c6 check, b takes, exchanges a pair of rooks, and now plays the move bishop d4. Rook takes c6 was better, king d6, e4, b takes e4, b takes e4, and now d takes e4, and that was um, white's idea. If knight takes e4, then just simply um, uh, b7. Okay, and there's no way to stop this pawn. This uh, b2 square is covered by the bishop. Of course, a8 is covered, and this is covered also. 
There's no way for the knight to get back. And if king c7, um, they just simply rook b1. Then what do you do? If king b8, then you just check and the king has to go. Of course, not that move either. Okay. This is why d takes e4 was played here. And of course, the knight can still drop back if, if b7. The knight can just drop back and save the day. However, he has to pay the price of the uh, crippled pawns. So knight d5, of course, right? We were just talking about the knight being there to save the day. And he plays knight d5, attacking the pawn, and then b7. And of course, now he realizes there's no way to stop it. So tremendous blunder. But again, this is why we're looking at short games. And the idea, again, is just to see in this particular game, White's plan of expanding on the queen side. This game is from the Hungarian Championship in 1964. Uh, Langiel versus uh, Josef Pogyats. And this game uh, shows the defensive uh, capabilities of the Fianchetto setup against the stone wall. So we can see the typical uh, setup here. Black goes for his um, king side attack, whereby white um, wants to go for his traditional attack on the queen side, transferring the pawn base from b7 to c6, and eventually attacking down the open uh, c file. So a5, okay, so this is one of the typical moves done in the stone wall. Sometimes black will ignore white's play on the queen side and just go for his play. Or sometimes he will try to slow white down on his side of the board and then go for his play. So in this case, black chooses the latter. Rook fd1, queen e8, preparing for the transfer of the queen to h5, knight e1, g5. Bishop comes back, queen h5. All right, so... Attack looks intimidating. White starts trading off. F takes e4. And now he plays f3. Okay, all of this is designed to slow blacks. Uh, attacks down. Queen d2. Threatening to just simply take this pawn check. h6. Black plays, excuse me, white plays b3. Bishop d6. And we can see the robust nature of the defense around uh the king okay with the with the uh fianchetto setup knight c2 and that knight wants to go to e3 and this is all about just white bulking up the defenses um this is one of those positions whereby if black uh doesn't really win by attack uh he is going to probably suffer in the ending scenario just due to uh the placements of his pawns. Although his pawns aren't too bad, uh, we can say his pawn structure is a bit worse uh, than White's. Bishop c7, knight e3, bishop d7, rook f1, black takes, e takes f3. Fantastic move by um, White here taking with the uh, bishop. He could have took taken with the pawn, but I like this... Uh, provocative move here bishop takes f3 now here black probably should have just played g4 here instead he plays queen h3 and that's why i said the move is uh provocative okay because black is probably thinking hey i'll play g4 you know you know and i have a i'm in a better place now with the queen bishop a3 slick move right it gets the bishop to a nice diagonal and also cuts off, attacks, excuse me, also attacks this rook right here. So the rook goes to f7. So now, black is still uh, in attack mode. Alright, he doesn't want to make a passive move with the rook. So he makes, he brings the rook to f7. And perhaps he has dreams of bringing the uh, rook to 
the H file, the G file, eventually. And what he does, though, is he cuts off the king from getting out because the rook is blocking here, this exit, and then the bishop has F8 blocked off. Queen D3. And now the tides start turning because now this is uh, threatened. Check. So he plays king g7. And then a thunderbolt comes. Bishop g4 again. Right? This video is like more about bishop, more about the bishop on g2 than actually the English opening. But it, that's, it, you know, if anything is driven home, it's the importance of, of that bishop. Again, the bishop just shows its value once again. Bishop g4 and uh, black had to resign here. Um, why did black have to resign? If knight takes g4, then it's going to be mate. And the reason why is because this bishop is cutting off this diagonal here. So rook takes f7. King takes uh, f7 and then the queen penetrates and notice the black black can't go on these dark squares so he has to go to say king e8 and then it's just mate here or, or g8 so he can't take the the bishop so all he can try to do is delay matters with the move like d takes e4 you know, like the computer type of moves, just go crazy, basically. Play queen takes f1 and stuff like that. So, again, that game right there was to show you the robust nature of defense and, of course, the value of the bishop on g2. This game is between Lubomir Ka uh, Kavalek, player named Newkirk, 1964. And we spoke about this double fianchetto setup before. And here's another example of it leading to a king side attack. So knight e5, black tries to dissolve the white center. And there's e4. So now we can see black with the full, excuse me, white with the full center. e5 driving the knight away. D takes c5, B takes c5, and now knight e4. So we can see black's, uh, white's intention on attacking on the... Um, on the king side. Uh, I think Alakon said this. I can't remember. But basically he said a pawn on e5 is a prelude to a king side attack. So most of the time it is. Bishop e7. Queen h5. Rook takes c1. Rook takes c1. Of course black did the right things trying to eliminate some pieces. White plays rook c2. Black penetrates. Right, Looks like a good move. But tactically, it's not working. Knight f6 is played. Of course, the knight can't. Knight on d5 can't uh, help. So g takes, e takes, rook takes b2, and unfortunately, that bishop capture is not going to help Black at all, and he resigned. I couldn't do a video. On the uh, English opening with by um, without including the master, uh, one of the great masters of this opening, uh, Leonid Stein, um, in in uh, in this or whatever. I I suggest if you're really serious about this opening, you study uh, this guy's this master's games. Um, he's just a great and great player. Um, this game is from the uh, Leningrad Championship in 1971. Uh, Stein is playing with the white pieces versus Roman Gingy Kashvili. And uh, let's have a look. I have another video too uh, on Stein. Um, if you look at my playlist, uh, I think it's called Master of the English Opening or something like that where I go over a couple of his games. There's one I have against Tal, Stein versus Tal, and Stein versus... Uh, Shank, uh, Shankovich, if I remember correctly. Here we have an English opening. It takes on a Catalan field, open Catalan field as the pawn is captured by a Roman. D takes c4, queen a4 check, bishop d7, queen takes c4. And like I said, white gets to uh, put his two pawns in the center. Uh, if he likes, however, the price for this is that his queen is a little bit exposed, and usually black 
uh, can gain some time knocking around the queen. One of the old lines was a6 and b5 and stuff like that. But the idea is still the same as gaining time off of the early uh, queen maneuver. Here's another idea is simply putting the bishop on c6 to trade off blacks, excuse me, white's powerful bishop. Castle, knight bd7, knight c3, knight b6. There it is, hitting the queen. Queen b3, a5. Queen has to move again, a4. So you can see, you know, the kind of compensation black seeks to gain uh, for giving up, you know, the center like that. Believe me, white is uh, not just gaining the center for nothing. e4, a3. And now knight e5. A takes b2. Bishop takes b2. Bishop a4. And things start to go downhill for Roman here. As of course he, he didn't want to give the bishop like that. He'd rather just trade the bishop here. Knight takes. And now rook a b1. Bishop e7. He preserves his bishop here. With the discovered attack on the... Uh, b7 pawn he plays queen c8 rook fc1 again major theme here is what the pressure on the queen side look at all of the pressure on the queen side all right and always keep an eye on this bishop right because again he's blocked by this pawn he's like out of the game but look at the tremendous pressure on the queen side here c6 D4, so there's the two-pawn center. Castles, queen B3, again, more pressure on the queen side. Rook A7, <clears throat> desperately trying to keep it together. Notice the B-pawn can't move because the C-pawn would drop. D5, just putting more pressure because look at the location of the queen and the location of this rook on C1. Knight c5, queen e3, more uncomfortable scenarios. Rook is not protected here, and then you have the queen here, so this knight can't really move. Rook takes a2, d takes. And b6, because if um, b takes c6, then the, the rook would just take there. Just get the, you know, give up the exchange. B6. Rook takes B6. Queen C7. Stein just plays knight C4 here. Now much stronger is just rook B5 here. And this kind of forces uh, black to give up the exchange on rook, uh, by playing rook takes A1. Instead... Stein played knight c4, which gave um, Roman a chance. And he should have played the move knight g4 here. And game would have been up for grabs. Would have been, you know, pretty uh, equal here. Instead, after knight c4, he played the move rook a4. And after bishop e5 by Stein, uh, Roman... Uh, resigned for example if queen to c8 simply knight d6 here bishop takes bishop takes rook and knight uh, knight are attacked here and that's just one example Another game by Stein here. Moscow 1971. Again, the power of the Fian Kettle Bishop along with his counterpart, the Dark Square Bishop. Again, we see this double Fian Kettle setup. And already Black is in trouble. It looks like a, you know, just you know, symmetrical looking position. Right? It looks like nothing could be wrong. However, with the bishop raking across the center like that, um, it gives black, uh, it gives white a lot of control in the position. 
as black can't really occupy any central uh, locations. Queen at five, right, solidifying the center even more. And after a seemingly normal move, rook fd8, just simply bishop e5. And just this powerful move, it just shows the... Uh, just shows how good of a chess player this guy was. Just real simple looking uh, chess. But there's really nowhere nowhere to go without losing material for black. Uh, just give you a quick example. Like rook takes d1, right? Rook takes. And then where are you going with the queen? <clears throat> so all you could play is a move like g6. Right? Here. Okay. Here. At the end of the day, he's still losing, losing material. Again, remember sometimes white conducts a kingside attack. He doesn't bother with attacking on the queen side, and you usually see this in combination with moves of d3, e4, and c4, the uh, Botvinnik setup, followed by the move uh, knight h4 to uh, f5, and then f4. Attacking on the king side. You follow this game here. This pawn f5, queen e5, rook a e1, queen g2, rook e5, and the tactical blow here, bishop f6, uh, closes the deal. And uh, this pawn couldn't capture this rook for uh, tactical reasons following the discovery of this knight. So that was just to show you the, uh, again, the flexibility of the opening that if you want, you can choose to attack the king. Our last game is between uh, G uh, GM Myron Scher versus a player named Ulrich Gebhardt. And this took place in Dortmund, 1993. Again, hopefully you picked it up by now. In this position um this reminds me of um more like a queen's indian a old queen's uh, old school queen's indian by transposition and um and it has a little bit uh feel also of uh, um oh i forgot the name of the line and queen's gambit decline uh that short and um that nigel short used to play but anyway you had these uh, hanging pawn, this hanging pawn structure, and um, kind of like a, almost like a terrace a little bit. You had this hanging pawn uh, structure as a result, and you had these two powerful bishops and uh, minor pieces uh, focused against them. All right, and um, thing about hanging pawns is they can be very powerful as long as they're together, but once they uh, start getting um, attacked and provoked forward they can become a tremendous liability main reason is that they have to be protected by pieces okay bishop e3 so we see the double attack and black doesn't want to you know black does not want to have to uh be forced to push okay so for instance if he's forced to push the knight f4 and d5 is going to drop and this, um, this is one of the um, uh, things that Fisher spoke about, about the uh, hanging pawns. And um, I believe Capablanca also said something about them too. Uh, knight a6 is played instead. Knight f4 anyway. Queen e5. Right? His idea is, hey, I'm going to lose the central pawn, but I'll get a pawn back here on b2. So knight takes d5, bishop takes d5, and queen d5. If bishop takes d5 here, yes, we love our bishop, but it would be a mistake because white would be walking right into a pin after rook a d8. And after, say, queen a4, rook d5, queen takes a6. And then grabbing the pawn. Yes, white is still a little bit better, but it's not as big of an advantage 
as he would like. Whoops, that's that's wrong, sorry. Rook e8, that's what I meant to do, protecting that um, bishop here. So instead of bishop takes d5, queen takes d5, offering the, change, the exchange of queens. Okay, because in this case, if black takes queen, takes d5, bishop takes d5, rook a b8. Remember, the, the rook is attacked. Then simply bishop c4. And uh, let's say knight b4. Um, you know, white is just um, white is just up a pawn. Okay, white is just winning up a pawn at the bishop pair. Perfect pawn structure. Black has two isolated pawns. And, um, you know, after simple moves like rook ac1, for instance, piling up on the pawn, there's really, um, you know, nothing that black can do but just wait for the L train to come and pick him up. So, after bishop takes d5, queen takes d5, and so black went to restore material equality, which is an instinct most of us have. And after queen... B2, guess what happened? Well, he lost to a simple tactic called the double attack. The bishop is attacking the rook on a8, and the queen on c4 is attacking the knight on a6. The best black can do is probably here is just knight uh, c7, and then he drops the rook uh, for little or no compensation here. So, a great way to end this video, again, with this bishop on g2 shining. So if you didn't learn anything about the English, know that that bishop on g2 is ex extremely valuable. And if you notice, if you go through all of these games, that bishop was not traded off unless there was some kind of big uh, advantage. Usually the, the game was over at that point and that bishop is traded off, you know, as a result of a tactical blow. All right, it was hardly just traded off in a, um, you know, haphazard manner because that bishop is very valuable. Even if it's not involved directly, usually underlying many of the tactical sequences is that bishop on g2 making it possible for the other pieces uh, uh, to conduct tactical activities. All right, so remember that. Also remember the options that... Uh, White has as far as conducting attacks on the queen side at times and also switching and conducting attacks on the king side. There's also your double fin kettle uh, setup. So it's a, again a rich position and depending again a lot of it depends on what black what look black gives you because knight f6 one knight f6 is very flexible. You know you could end up in king's Indian Nimzo uh, type position but nonies. Tarish, you know, as you see here, um, you know, the list goes on and on. But um, hopefully this video combined with the second video, C4 Knight of 6 and C4 E5 with 2G3 from White being the main response gives you a little insight. Um, there's tons of other lines, like for instance, after C4, Black can just play C5. There's C4 G6. Um... But I find that a lot of those might transpose. So I figure just giving you a general overview with C4, uh, Knight of 6 and C4, E5 should give you um, enough information whereby you might be able to pick those uh, lines up. So I hope that this uh, video did you justice. Again, my suggest suggestion, you watch it twice, go over it again, and then start playing Blitz games. Play. Um, that's if you're interested in this opening. You play... One minute games, bullet games, and you play three minute and five minute games until you just get a feel, you know, of what you should be doing. And then if you're still interested and you like the opening, then start looking at some longer uh, competitive games. And again, I suggest that you look at the game, the old school English games, look at uh, some ready games, look at Max Erva games and see the progression of the theory. And then look at Botvinnik, Korsnoy. Great English players. Um, oh, and Stein, of course, the master of the English, uh, Leonard Stein. And uh, 
go for go from there. It'd be a great addition to your repertoire, but just be prepared to uh, put in a lot of work. So again, check my links below. Please like, subscribe, donate. Uh, if you have, you know, you can spare it. And um, you know, check the links below. There's DVDs, books down there related to this specific opening. And I'll see you guys next time. Oh yeah, before I forget, if you have any requests, you know, let me know. All right specific opening i'll go i'll go over it just like i did with this one it might not be as long but just due to the nature of this opening i had to make make it long